Good evening, everyone, and um, welcome to the scientist webinar Hands on Experiments from Their Experiences. This webinar is organized by European Schoolnet in partnership with the Scientist Project. My name is Rocío Benito, and on behalf of the Scientist team, I would like to thank you all for joining us. Before I introduce our speakers, please let me go over a few housekeeping rules. My colleagues Maria Dios and Julia Lotina are attending and supporting this webinar. If you experience technical issues, please leave us a message in the chat. They will also be sharing a link to a signature list for this event. Please take a short moment to fill it, as it's important for us to be able to organize future events. In addition, only by filling this form, you will be able to receive a certificate of attendance for this webinar. Finally, we will be taking questions to our speakers in writing, and we will solve them at the end of the presentations. So feel free to ask any questions you might have to our speakers in the chat. Today with us, we have Michael Gregory, a scientist ambassador for France. He will present two collaborative projects to promote access to hands-on science by facilitating the exchange of ideas for low-cost experiments, experiment shares for educators, and just international for students. He is accompanied by his colleagues, Julia Realdon, she's a biologist, Panayotis Lassos, he's a physics teacher in Greek secondary education, and Astrinos Tsoutsoudakis, coordinator of the first science laboratory center of Heraklion, Crete. And now I will pass the floor to Michael. Thank you. Excellent. Uh, thank, thank you for that introduction. And uh, thank you for having me here for another Scientix webinar. Uh, it's, it's great to be back. Um, and thank you to everyone at Scientix and to the other presenters who are joining me for experiments. Um, so, as was said, I'm Michael Gregory. I'm a Scientix ambassador in Paris, France, and I'm here to talk to you about two projects uh, uh, to share experiments between students and teachers. Um, so the two projects are called Yes International Meetings, which are student-based uh, projects for meetings for students to share experiments via Zoom and experiment shares, which is kind of like a teacher's version of that, show, showing quick demos of experiments. Um, before I get to some of the details of that, just a couple of the motivation and background and like why that would seem to be a good idea and why I started those this year and this year specifically. Um, so one of the reasons for it is something that I call the disease model for the spread of good ideas, uh, which is based on the concept that Science itself is universal, but how we teach it varies widely from one place to another, especially from one country to another, but even one school to another, one region to another. And I liken that to how diseases pop up and how they spread. So everyone, your students included, is probably fairly familiar with how diseases spread now or how a pandemic spreads. So we'd have a new strain of a, a microbe that pops up somewhere. Sometimes we can identify it having evolved from an existing strain of somewhere, something else. Sometimes we're not quite sure where the origins are. But if it succeeds from an evol evolutionary point of view, it will pass on from one person to another, first spreading in a local area, and then jumping to another area, spreading in that area, until we have whole regions or pockets, or eventually countries. And if it's a very successful microbe, it could spread around the world. The same way if a teacher comes up with a new demonstration or experiment to teach a scientific concept. If that works well, they'll tend to spread that with their friends, their colleagues, might spread through a school first, maybe through a local town or area where different people know each other. If they exchange ideas with people the next town over, you might have the next town become a pocket for that new experiment and so on. But it can take a lot of time for some experiments to jump barriers from one region to another, one country to another, one language to another. And so I've come up with a number of ideas to try and spread the disease of good ideas and become a vector for the spread of experiments or a super spreader for neat experiments from one place to another. Um, so when I, when I started trying to do this, I, I traveled a lot by person and I made a YouTube channel. You, you should check it out if you don't know it already. My favorite experiments. And the principle behind it is that I go around to different places asking teachers, researchers, and professors to share one of their favorite experiments with me. 
I share it forwards sometimes via my YouTube channel, but in, in practice, it takes a huge amount of time filming, editing videos. It, so there's only maybe one out of 10 experiments that makes it onto there. Um, but a lot more than that, make it into life in my classroom. They might get modified, passed on to colleagues or passed on to other people, like through this Scientix webinar or through further travels or through experiment shares. And yes, for young enthusiastic scientists. So um, since the Zoom revolution, um, the past year or two, a lot of us have gotten really comfortable exchanging ideas online, especially through online meetings like this current video conference. So it's become a lot easier to meet teachers without actually needing to travel. And so I've had the idea to suggest monthly meetings where any teachers who are interested show up those who are up for it and brave enough share one of their favorite experiments and everyone gets to see a variety of different experiments. Um, this was inspired by a number of different projects or things and I've highlighted a couple of them on this slide. Uh, the boring text one in the top left is a semi successful workshop series I started during the first set of uh, lockdowns during the pandemic called Active Science Through Distance Education. And this was a weekly or bi weekly um, webinar where I'd encourage teachers who joined to share practices with each other. Uh, unfortunately, it didn't really get a critical mass up. There were some that there was only me and one or two other people. Uh, but still, the, the theme of that, trying to share ideas between teachers and facilitate exchange between teachers, has been a guiding theme. Um, I've also put a couple other ones, like in the bottom right, there's uh, Science on Stage. A number of you are probably familiar with the Science Stein Stage Festival and Network. Um, and a lot of principles of that are showing short experiments and sharing them with a lot of different people as well. Uh, also, I, I definitely need to mention the Perimeter Institute for Theoretical Physics. Last uh, June or the very beginning of July, I was on their science teacher camp and they had a, a special event called Kitchen Wars, where we were all encouraged to prepare a short demonstration for an experiment. There were about 10, 12 of us who did. And in that one session, we were able to, within an hour or two, uh, see a whole bunch of different experiments around the world. So based on that model in August, and then starting again in November, I invited teachers first from that perimeter group, um, but also from Scientix, Science on Stage, local networks here in Paris, um, Exploratorium Teacher Networks from California, CERN Teacher Networks, really anyone I could invite to come along uh, for these experiment shares. Um, the, the first one in August was quite small. During summer holidays, it's hard to get a large number of teachers uh, anywhere. But I was impressed that the eight teachers we had were from four different continents. We had two of my friends, uh, Chris and Samuel from Ghana, there are a couple of teachers from Canada where the Teacher Institute is, uh, Snehal from India, and well, I guess me in, in France. So yeah, that, that makes four continents. Uh, and three of us presented experiments uh, and we had a good time and it worked well. Uh, so I knew that there was potential to do more, but I didn't get around to setting the next one until November. Uh, November was significantly bigger. There were about 35 teachers and might seem odd that I say from about 15 to 25 countries. Uh, if you squint and look at the, the graph on the left, you'll see there were 75 people who showed up, uh, who signed up, but only 35 who showed up. So there were people signed up from about 25 countries. I'm guessing about 15 were represented there. Uh, I think it's probably a similar thing for this webinar. Like we, we have 52 people here right now, and I think there were over 100 signed up. And I, It'll be hard to say exactly where all of you come from unless you all tell us with the survey afterwards, which you should fill out. I, I think I'm supposed to encourage you to, to do that. Um, and this graph down below from the Google form just shows uh, there were about half of all people who signed up for that were got the word from Scientix. So that was the, the biggest spreader of like the, this invitation. Uh, the second biggest was Science on Stage, which is a, like a um, that one there, a uh, number from Perimeter Institute, and everyone else I tried to invite through all the other means uh, represented there. 
And for the next one coming up, uh, December 19th on Sunday, so far, most of them are saying they got the message directly from me. Um, so hopefully we'll get some more from, uh, from Scientix as well, maybe after this webinar. Um, on that note, the next experiment share is coming up Sunday at 5 o'clock Central e European time. Uh, there's the link there, which should be added to the chat momentarily if it hasn't been done so yet. And I strongly encourage you to, to come along, check it out, either to see what's going on or if you're brave enough to share an experiment, there's still time probably for three or more people to sign up to share experiments. Um, so hope to see you there. The next one after that, uh, I haven't confirmed the date for sure, but it's probably going to be Wednesday, January 12th, just to try a weekday one. Um, I always, when people sign up, try and see if weekdays, weekends, daytime, they, you know, when works best for the most number of people. Seems about sli split between weekdays and weekends, so probably going to try a weekday one in January. Um, I'm almost done talking and we'll get to some uh, experiments, which will, which will be more interesting than me just talking at you. Uh, but I also want to briefly mention uh, yes for young enthusiastic scientists. So this is the, the student version of the same project. I founded a science club at my school uh, a couple of years ago that was based largely on one of the great ideas I had seen when, while traveling was based on um, Let's Talk Science, which is an outreach um, club uh, nationwide in Canada where they bring university students into local schools to share hands-on experiments. And so I decided to transpose that model uh, and also have like a version, a next generation version of something I used to run called the Homemade Lab Project, where I got students to try and make all their homemade lab equipment. And I founded Young Enthusiastic Scientists, where I have high school students come up with hands-on activities that they run in middle school classes. So they'll practice it to, uh, together with me. They'll bounce ideas off of each other, off of me, and then turn something into a lesson plan where they come up with a minute-by-minute -minute plan that will send out to the middle school high, uh, the middle school teachers, and the teachers who are interested will ask these high school students to come in and run experiments in our in their class. And a uh, uh, very brief story about the middle photo there, that's a chocolate fossil experiment. And that's one I came up with. I'd gone to Madrid for a long weekend and I'd, I'd gone there because I was trying to share ideas and experiments in France and it just wasn't working. No one here seemed to be interested in my project, asking them what their favorite experiments were, trying to show some of the ones I had seen from around the world. And I thought, well, if things weren't, aren't working in France, then may as well try Spain. Um, I speak Spanish. I know that people there generally tend to be more open to collaboration than people in France. Had an amazing time there. And one of the ideas from the Natural History Museum in Madrid was to use dental alginate to um, model fossilization. So they used different shells. They mixed alginate, which sets, like it's kind of like a plaster that sets within a minute or two. And they made copies of, of different shells. And on the plane back to Paris, I had the idea, alginate should be edible if dentists use it for molding teeth, or like it should be safe to have around food. And kids love chocolate. So why don't I try getting a bunch of alginate get chocolate and make chocolate copies uh, of the fossils. And I tested it out one morning with primary school students. They loved it. Then later that day tried with my yes uh, group. They loved it as well. By the end of the week had a lesson plan that they were doing in middle school classes the next week. So just awesome turnaround on that. Um, with my yes group, we've also gone internationally. Here's a photo of two of my best students uh, presenting a beer bottle gas thermometer at St. Francis College of Education in Ghana, West Africa. Uh, here we are with me leading them in a presentation uh, at CERN in Geneva. Um, and the other two founding groups for YES International were two science clubs that I helped inspire at Capasa Senior Technical School in Ghana and Ho International School in Ho, Ghana. And when we started Yes International meetings, it was just the three of us meeting pretty much weekly through May and June. But by yesterday, we had grown to have people from three more countries. We had uh, Maria from Greece, um, 
uh, Amir Yata from Albania and Gordana's students from Serbia joining. And we're looking for more to, uh, to join in the fun as well. So, oh, and here's the meetings we've had so far. Uh, just a shot from uh, yesterday's meeting where my students were showing bioplastics. So we see them up top. We see Chris in Ghana as well as uh, Samuel and his students and Maria in Greece. I think Maria is here in this meeting as well. She's a scientist ambassador in Heraklion Crete. Um, and so if you're interested in, jo oh, if you're interested in joining, I'll give you the link at the end. But for now, I've talked way too long. Uh, I can't convince you these are interesting just by talking about them. The real way to uh, grab your attention is with some experiments. So I've invited some of the most exciting presenters we've had uh, from the last experiment share back to show some of their experiments. Um, so without more talking at you on my part, I'd like to turn things over to my friend Takis in Athens, who's going to show you uh, one or two of the experiments that he showed at the experiment share uh, last month in November. Takis, we cannot hear you. Now you can. Now we can. Thank you. OK, R wrong button. <laughs> I was saying that I'm very glad to be here. Uh, I want to thank uh, both Scientix and Michael for the invitation. I will try to be fast in the next five minutes. So uh, first of all, here you see a good old classic incandescent uh, bulb. It has an extra long uh, filament for decorative reasons. It costs about five to six euros. And it is powered by 220 volt AC from the electrical power network. Now, um, if we bring a magnet near the bulb, we will clearly observe that the filament starts to oscillate quite fast. And in fact, the frequency of this oscillation is a frequency of the electrical power network, which is uh, 50 hertz in Greece. So I'm changed to I'm going to change the camera, hopefully. Okay, try to ignore this small lamp. This is the lamp, the bulb we are interested. And uh, we bring the magnet near the filament. And I hope you can see the oscillation. Is it visible? Because it is quite bright. Is it visible for everyone? I think yes, we can see it, yes. Nice. It's a very fast oscillation. Uh, the eye cannot track it because uh, it's uh, the frequency is 50 uh, hertz. So um, what happens here? There is a Laplace force acting on the filament. The direction of this force changes as the direction of the current changes as well. This results to the oscillation of the filament. There is an inverted way to present this experiment. We could just ask the students how they could uh, tell if the current in this filament is DC or AC without using any type of uh, measuring instruments. It's a very simple and quite impressive uh, experiment, I hope. <laughs> so let's go to the second uh, experiment. I call it expansion bomb. Uh, you know, know that the breaking of water pipes due to the abnormal expansion of water when it freezes is a known phenomenon and causes various problems. It is certainly impressive that freezing water can cause cracks in metal objects. And moreover, it is rather against the intuition of our students. Our students don't expect that uh, water, even in the form of ice, could break uh, metal. During the 19th century, a way to demonstrate this was by using large bomb cells, which were being completely filled with water, secularly plugged, and left out a whole night during very cold weather. In the morning, they were found cracked all around the middle with a large belt of ice. Uh, Objects like small bombs can still be found in old school laboratories, and they were used for this demonstration. Now, uh, today is not easy to find bomb cells, hopefully. 
but we can have a similar demonstration by using this inexpensive uh, material. We need one galvanized coupling for water pipe. The one edge is uh, half an inch wide, and the other edge is three uh, three fourths of an inch. So we have different diameter. And we also need two iron plugs. One uh, goes there, is half an inch, and the other goes to, uh, to the other edge. Um, we don't want to trap air bubbles inside the set, so we put the coupling inside a container full of water. And inside the water, we, uh, we close the pipe. And then we put it in the freezer for about one or two hours. The result is quite impressive. I hope you can see the crack. It's very easy, it's very cheap. This is the only material it, that you cannot use again. The, the two uh, ends, you can, use it, you can use them again as many times as you wish. And the total cost is something about two euros. Uh, do I have uh, time for one uh, last experiment? Do I have one more minute? Yes, go ahead. Nice. Thank so, you. Uh, the last uh, object I like to use, and it's again quite uh, cheap, is the one you are going to see now. I change against the camera. Is that you can find it as an octopus or spider head massage. Uh, it costs about three euros. Uh, normally, not in, not by physics teacher, is used for that. It's very relaxing. But if you are a physics teacher, and that perhaps makes you not a very normal type of person, you can demonstrate by that uh, resonance. Because as you can see, here are eight legs. Four of them are short legs. Four of them are lengths of uh, bigger length. So if I do that, only the big legs are oscillating. If I do that, if I start to oscillate a short leg, only the four short legs can oscillate. And someone could add a piece of plastiline uh, or something else in one leg, and then that leg will not oscillate anymore because its uh, frequency will have been uh, changed. This is... Uh, the three experiments I would like to show you. I hope you like that. Thank you so much, Sakis. Bye. Um, next, um, I think we have, um, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, Astrinos. Uh, he is the coordinator of the First Science Laboratory Center of Heraklion, Heraklion Cret. Uh, he will show us some experiments. Well, uh, hello, everyone. Uh, I'm very happy to be uh, here with you tonight. Uh, I'm going to demonstrate uh, uh, Barton's uh, pendulum, which uh, is uh, used to, uh, uh, as we have uh, a lot of earthquakes in uh, Greece, and recently we had uh, some uh, uh, very strong earthquakes uh, on Crete. And, uh, uh, we, we try to uh, make uh, our students understand uh, uh, why uh, one building uh, shakes uh, more compared to uh, some uh, other, and uh, that uh, depends on uh, uh, the type of construction, maybe the height or maybe the total mass. Uh, but of course, we try to make things as uh, simple as uh, possible. Uh, uh, here I have uh, a simplified uh, version of uh, Barton's pendulum. I have uh, two uh, balls, uh, Christmas balls, uh, attached to uh, ropes of uh, different length. And uh, then I will uh, try to uh, move them to make them oscillate in uh, Uh, what I always do first is uh, 
uh, tying a, a small rope between uh, the, the two pen, uh, pendulums. Uh, and of course, this uh, uh, lead, uh, almost always leads to a misconception that uh, I try to uh, uh, pull uh, this uh, little rope sideways, uh, so it's not uh, it's not something that uh, uh, it is uh, uh, because of uh, physics, but it's uh, something that I actually uh, force to it to happen. Uh, but uh, okay, uh, then. I will not uh, uh, demonstrate uh, the experiment uh, with this uh, with the, this rope between, but I will push this here and then I will tie it here. So just to well. Uh, I have uh, uh, this length from uh, the top to the center of mass of this ball is about uh, 17 centimeters, which will be, uh, uh, which will have a period of, uh, well, something uh, uh, less than uh, one, uh, one second. And this is, uh, well, almost, uh, it's 40. Uh, and that this makes uh, for uh, about uh, 1.5 uh, seconds uh, for its period. And uh, what I will do is uh, use, uh, I hope that everything is uh, good on camera, is it? Can you see? Okay. So, I First, uh, I will try to move only the green ball here. Uh, I will uh, use uh, my eye to hand coordination. So uh, I will be only looking uh, the green ball and as soon as, as it starts oscillating, I pull each time it reaches uh, this uh, side, so I transfer uh, energy in the most efficient way by uh, doing it uh, at the same uh, time, every one period, every 1.5 uh, uh, second. And uh, then I stop. I make it stop. And I will do the same with the orange. Just remember that uh, you have to pull uh, as soon as it starts moving. And of course, uh, your hand will uh, provide energy at the same rate. So you, you can uh, demonstrate uh, resonance. And uh, this is uh, a very good point to discuss uh, uh, maybe the history of uh, science, for example, uh, that uh, the, the period, the, the time that uh, is needed uh, from this point to go to uh, there and go back is uh, irrelevant. Uh, uh, the, the time is irrelevant to the path, and uh, this is uh, was. Uh, first observed by Galileo Galilei with uh, two different chandeliers uh, during uh, uh, well, he, he was uh, just sitting uh, in a church and uh, uh, observing uh, one uh, of uh, the chandeliers uh, going, uh, the one that was closest to the door that was uh, affected uh, uh, by the wind uh, in a uh, more effective way. It was uh, swinging uh, back and uh, uh, forth and back, uh, uh, the, uh, making a, a very long path, while the other was uh, just uh, doing it uh, uh, 
uh, the, a very small uh, path, and uh, but both of them were at uh, this uh, point. I mean, uh, near, uh, for example, the door at the same time, and uh, uh, there at uh, also at the same time, uh, and this was not affected by the. Uh, uh, the path. So uh, I ask my students to uh, calculate uh, the time uh, needed for uh, maybe 10 or 20 oscillations and then divide it uh, by the oscillations and uh, find the period. And then they, uh, I, they are asked to do it with uh, even with closed eyes because they can count uh, with closed eyes. They can always count seconds like 1001 1002 so they they can do the same thing well i think that's all uh, thank you so much Astrinos. and now it's time for julia she's a biologist and scientist ambassador please julia go ahead uh, hi everybody i'm julia from italy i am presenting you a model you can see uh, my face a little but uh, uh, big enough, a uh, plastic tank with uh, water, the same salinity as uh, seawater, and inside there is a second container with uh, two holes, two opening, one on top and one at the bottom. This uh, model is a replica of an historical model built by Louis Ferdinand Marsili, who is uh, recognized as the first oceanographer in the world. At the end of the 17th century, we, Ferdinand Marsili, traveled with the diplomatic mission to the Constantinople, to the Bosphorus uh, uh, between Europe and Asia. And uh, as he was, he was also a scientist, uh, uh, in addition to being a diplomat, he uh, measured the density of seawater, which is different in the Black Sea and the Mediterranean. And moreover, he measured the currents flowing through the Bosphorus Strait. One, he, uh, when he went back to Italy, he built a material model of the flows across the Bosphorus Strait. He built uh, a box uh, with wood, uh, with a transect, with a, with a wall, and two openings. I put uh, one plastic uh, um, container into the uh, larger one because it is easier to build this way. I added the complete protocol in the chat so you can see how to build with the instructions this model. Now let's produce the currents. First I am producing the current of the uh, Mediterranean seawater which is uh, saltier and denser than uh, the water of the uh, Black Sea. So I will use uh, uh, some uh, tap water. I add uh, salt uh, until I have a saturated uh, solution. I mean, with the solid body, body at the bottom. I color it with the food coloring. So this is uh, salty, dense water, uh, the Mediterranean water, and I pour in my device. As you can imagine, this water is uh, dense, will flow at the bottom, and uh, will pass through the uh, bottom opening, as in the real Marsilis model of uh, the end of the uh, 17th century. You can see the blue water, dense Mediterranean water, flowing through the container. Then I simulate the water from the Black Sea. It is uh, a rainy region, so the water is uh, uh, less dense, less salty. I use tap water without salt and another food coloring that is red. 
you can use uh, the same kind of model, substituting salty and fresh water with uh, cold and warm water that uh, also flow this way in the sea and across the straits. So, second try, this is a less dense uh, water. And I am pouring steadily in, in the water, in the tank. If you can see the red, less dense, less salty water will float at the surface and begin to cross the opening at the top and go and reach the, the other side of the container. So you can see the red shadow flowing through the strait and we can add some more water, colored water. And you see the red layer spreading in the container, crossing the opening and reaching the other side of the Marsilis tank. So with very few equipment, a few euros, you can simulate, simulate the flow of uh, currents through the strait. The same is valid too for the Gibraltar Strait. And that's all from me. You can have the protocol in the link in the chat. Many thanks. Thank you so much, Julia. And um, now we'll go back to Michael. He will present some experiments. Thank you, Michael. Uh, excellent. No. Michael, you're mute now. <laughs> we cannot hear you. Now, no? can you hear me? Yes, now. <laughs> okay, I figured out how to work teams. Now for the uh, actual experiment. So, my original plan I had proposed was to have students join to share some highlights from YES International meetings but I was told that was too complicated for permissions and whatnot. So I'm gonna show some of the experiments that they would have shown if we were gonna show some highlights from YES International meetings. Um, well, and also one or two other experiments because I just like showing a lot of experiments. So the first one I'm gonna show, out of curiosity, in the chat, tell me if you're joining us from Serbia and if you saw me in person at the Scientix, con uh, Scientix conference in Belgrade. Uh, because I was in Serbia sharing a couple experiments with friends and teachers and um, as a, by coincidence there was a Scientix national conference and so Tanya uh, who's a great Scientix ambassador invited me along and I was invited by their national contact point to give like a, an address to the 100 teachers there. This experiment didn't work out there so I want to show for the benefit of anyone who saw me fail with this experiment. Um, so you can see I have a banana and a key. The reason it's a banana is because they had a banana themed talk right before mine. But I'm going to drop the banana and the key at the same time and observe what happens. And so you can see the banana didn't reach the ground, but the key stopped it. And the reasoning behind that is that <clears throat> as the banana accelerates downwards, it accelerates the key so it gets a higher and higher speed whereas the radius of curvature gets smaller and smaller. So as the radius of curvature gets smaller and the speed gets higher, but I'll have enough to go around and make a circle until friction stops it falling. And the reason why this didn't work on Saturday, if anyone's interested in troubleshooting experiments, uh, was because the keys were too heavy. I borrowed Tanya's car keys. I didn't have any keys on me. And on stage when I realized they were too heavy, I was fumbling too much with it and didn't get it working. So if you saw me fail with that one in person, uh, 
it doesn't fail every time. If you have a light enough key, it works. Uh, I'm going to show another one that was one of my students' favorites, and we brought this around when recruiting new members. So we go around to different home uh, homerooms and like homeroom classes in the high school, showing things. And this was an easy one to move around. You might recognize this and might be able to tell us how it works based on something you've seen very recently. Uh, but Rossio, can I get you to give me a hand with this one? And can you pick one of the bananas, the short, the medium, or the long? Okay, let's go for the medium. The medium, everyone picks the medium. And I want you to look at the medium and just stare at the medium. And we should notice the medium is now swinging a lot bigger than the others. Yes, it does. So that, thank you. you, you helped get the medium one going. Now, now pick one of the other ones. OK, the short. The short, OK. So same thing. Now we get the short one going wildly. Yes. Can you explain what's going on here? I'm not sure. <laughs> so it's the, the same idea as Astronos' Barton's pendulum. So if I swing it with the natural frequency, so now I'm swinging my arms with the frequency of the middle one, I get the middle one going wildly. Or if I try with the long, so I'll stop it. And I get the long going, oh, hard not to get the medium. But if I do it at the time period the medium one goes, I can get the long and so on. And the trick to, to this, like with the illusion at first, was just being subtle enough with the movement. Like it doesn't take much to excite it with the resonant frequency. And unless you're really looking close, you don't notice that I'm swinging the top bar in frequency with the middle one. Um, so it's a good one that can also be framed as a magic trick, depending on uh, who you're who you're doing it with. Uh, another quick one to show here. This is one that came up during one in May or the very first one in June, like beginning of June, either late May or early June. Capasso Senior Technical School was doing one on air. So what I've got is two balloons from the same pack of balloons. They should be identical except the color. And I'm just going to blow them up different amounts and connect them. So the red one, which is fairly full, and I'm just going to put it on this PVC tube so it can connect with the purple one and air can flow freely when I release it. And the purple one with a much smaller amount of air. And I want everyone who's up for it to make a prediction in the chat in the chat so right in the chat if you think when i release it air will go from the purple one into the blue one from the red into the purple or nothing at all and i'm going to wait until i get at least two or three responses in the chat if you think blue empties into red red empties into blue or nothing Okay, one person thinks purple to red. We have more than three. <laughs> okay. Seems that a lot of people think purple into red. I wonder if anyone thinks red. Oh, okay, red, red into blue or red into purple. So it's it's mixed. It's mixed. When I ask students, they usually predict the red will flow into the purple. But if we let it go, the purple goes into the red, which for most people is counterintuitive because you're used to thinking of equilibria. But air will flow from higher pressure to lower pressure. And of course, when a balloon is less filled, the rubber is stretched less thin. As it gets bigger, the rubber gets thinner and thinner. The thinner the rubber is, the less hard it can stretch, the lower the pressure will be. So there's a greater amount of air in the bigger one. More work has been done against pressure to fill it. However, the pressure in the smaller one is going to be greater and air will flow from lower pressure to higher pressure. I'm going to show one more really quick one before con concluding. And this is one that was shown just last night by my students. And last night's YES International meeting was the first one where we had groups other than the first three founding groups. So the founding groups who have been at pretty much every YES International meeting are my own students in Paris. 
uh, the students at Ho International School in Ghana and uh, the students at Kampasa Senior Technical School. And yesterday we were joined by students from uh, Pojega, Serbia, uh, students of uh, Gordana. We were joined by students of Maria, who I think is here on this webinar. She's a Scientix ambassador in Crete. And we were joined by Mirjeta, who's a Scientix ambassador and the national coordinator for science on stage in Albania. And all of them seem eager for their students to present at once in January. So if anyone else joins into this network, uh, or like joins into these meetings, expect to see some experiments from them. So I've just taken food coloring and milk, and I'm going to take a little bit of soap and dip it in. A number of you have seen this before. Uh, I wouldn't show this if it weren't for my students having just shown it yesterday. And hopefully that showed up. When I put a little bit of soap, it'll break the surface tension, and we'll see the color fleeing away. And that's a great demonstration, a very popular one with kids, of the effect of soap on surface tension. And sometimes to explain why things would move, I liken it to popping a balloon. So to pop a balloon, you only need a tiny hole and the tension of the balloon will pull the rest of it away. Similarly, in a surface of water, if it's held together by surface tension, it just takes a tiny hole and you'll have things spread out from there. And because that's one of the ones that was shown just last night, that's going to be the last experiment I present. Um, Rocio or Maria, can you help get my slides back up just for the concluding goodbye slide? Um, and yes. Perfect. <laughs> so two things to mention with this, and I, I guess two slides then related to this. Oh, and just before the oh, I lost it. I wanted to show a quiz game. Uh, yeah. OK, so as the slides are getting pulled up and I need to uh, take control of the slides, but this is a uh, electronic quiz game with a homemade circuit, which Ho International students showed how to do the wiring for this. Um, I would show you it lighting up when we get the correct answers, but some of it's come loose. Um, true to form with homemade stuff, all of these connections here are paper clips because I didn't understand that they wanted uninsulated wire for that part, so I just had regular wire. And rather than stripping like 20 different sections of wire during the meeting uh, to follow along live, I snapped paper clips in half and used them for the connectors. OK, do, do we have my slides up again? It's loading. It will take maybe a few moments. OK, no, that's that's OK. I can talk without them uh, as well. So. Uh, the, the two last things to mention are, in addition to the online experiment shares, which I hope everyone ends up joining, I've noticed there's at least 15 people who signed up during this webinar, um, so that's great to see. Hopefully some of you will contact me to join Yes International meetings with your students, but also in-person sharing of experiments. When travel is possible or in your local area, it's great to, to get to do that. So. I wanted to briefly thank everyone who welcomed me in Serbia um, last week. I had an exam week at my school, and so I fled exams because I believe assessment and overassessment is the worst possible thing for education. And I went to Serbia, which is a lot more active in networks like Scientix. You might notice if you look this up, and like if you don't believe me, look it up afterwards. France has one of the biggest populations in Europe. We have a total of four Scientix ambassadors, including myself. Serbia, I would need to double check the population, but it's a fraction of France's, and they have something like 30 Scientix ambassadors. Um, so if you're looking to go somewhere where you want to share experiments or meet eager teachers, it's always best to leave France and go somewhere uh, where you can connect with people like Scientix ambassadors. Um, so I'd like to thank everyone who welcomed me there, where I managed to do in-person experiment shares. And then following that, uh, just to conclude, inviting everyone to join the fund. So I've, I've mentioned this every five minutes or so throughout anything I've said, but please come join the experiment shares. I'm running them once a month. So if you don't make it this time, please come in January or come in February or February, uh, March or so on and so forth. The next one is Sunday at five o'clock. Uh, there's a link and it's being added to the chat so you can sign up. Um, there's also a link to just 
like my welcome page. It's a simple Google Doc because I don't have time for fancy websites, but I might get around to that over the holidays. Um, but if you're looking for the January dates, once I confirm if it's January 12th, please come. And if you're interested in Yes International, rather than a form to sign up because like there's some exchange and setting a time, inviting your students to come, things like that, email me about it. So my email is down below. Um, with that, I think that's everything I wanted to say. Uh, I hope to see you guys at some of these meetings. And if you have any questions or ideas to make it better, please let me know either in the question and answer period or drop me a line later and I'll be really happy to hear from you. Um, thanks again for joining us and thank you to Astrinos, Takis and Julia for the great experiments they shared and Rocio and Maria and, and Julia and everyone at Scientix for making this happen. Thank you so much, uh, Michael, for attending and presenting this amazing presentation and experiments for four of you. Uh, so we have received um, a lot of replies and like people in the chat has reacted a lot to your experiments. They were amazing and I think they are quite easy to, to put into practice uh, into their classes. Um, we have some questions. Uh, so the first one, um, what would you say an experiment has to have to be successful among students? That's that's a great question. So I take a step back from that. And for me, for an experiment to be successful, it first needs to be successful for a teacher. And by that, I mean, there's 59 of you approximately, if I go by like what the participation uh, level says. And I'm guessing less than 59 of you, probably less than 10 of you are going to put one of these experiments into your practice in the next week or so. No matter how much you liked the experiment, if you don't see it as something that's accessible and you're able to do, then you'll say, oh, that was nice. I like that. But you won't go the next step further and make it happen in your classroom. So for me, for an experiment to be successful, the entry barrier needs to be as low as possible. And that's why I encourage everyone who I see or like the ideas that I most like and repeat myself to have the least expensive materials, the most common things you can get, and they need to be related to what people are actually teaching. Because it can't just be something that's curious. And well, it can be curious and fun for the sake of fun. But if that's all it does, then it has it's much harder for teachers to put into the classroom. So it's got to be related to something that teachers feel they need to teach. Once those things are in place, then I'd say any experiment you do with students isn't really a waste of time, or at least compared to like writing or other forms of instruction. Because even if it's not the absolute best experiment, as long as it's something that they're doing, something that, that they're seeing, a real physical phenomenon that they can play with, be curious about, talk about later, then it doesn't need to be the best possible experiment. It just needs to be like that they are exposed to a lot of experiments. I, I, I hope that kind of makes sense as an answer. Yeah, I think it's a great answer. <laughs> Thank you for it. We have um, more questions. Um, so Eddie says, is there an online repository of experiments to use with the students? And, and I, I tried to reply to that a bit in the chat. So. My answer is yes and no. Um, in some ways, my YouTube channel is a growing repository of experiments that I filmed in different places. I, I already flagged up a number of problems with it, including being way behind editing videos. Um, I filmed some great stuff, both with Takis and Astrinos when I was in Greece, now almost two months ago. Hopefully I'll be able to put that online uh, over the holidays when I have some time to catch up on things, but. It's a very incomplete repository. Um, or if people prefer like written instructions, sometimes uh, people prefer that as well. Then from the experiment shares at least, I've encouraged teachers who presented experiments to provide a written description, list of materials. So teachers looking through can like look on it and decide, okay, this is one that I have these materials or this is related to my learning goals. So in that way, it's kind of like a repository, but I don't, well, first of all, it's not a big repository yet because experiment shares like this are fairly new. 
Um, but also I don't, I haven't yet figured out any like functionality where you could search across all of them by topic or like that kind of thing The the project doesn't yet have that size of amplitude where, um, that's feasible at the time. Although like it's, it's a great idea. Well, you can write it down for the future. <laughs> I think so many teachers would be interested in it. Um, one last question, I think. This is an important general question that could give some general tips for teachers. So uh, could you give us some tips to make students passionate about the STEM? Um, so like the, the biggest thing, and that's kind of what these two projects are on, to, to get them passionate or interested in things, do as many experiments and as many demos as possible. So don't just talk to them. Certainly don't just talk at them or write at them, but have them doing things um, and that'll get them more interested. But also kind of related to that, one of my favorite tricks or tips is to get them thinking about science or get them communicating about science without realizing they're doing it. Like rather than saying you have homework, go home and do this, write this down, give them something or show them something that they can't resist thinking about, trying to figure out what it was they saw that day or they want to show friends or parents or siblings to try and either impress them with something that can confuse their friends or like something that they're proud of showing off and explaining. And that way you gain on like time that they're actually thinking about what you want them to think about. Because if you say like, for example, the example of the, the resonant pendulum, like, you could get them to write down a definition of resonance and you could ask them to solve problems on resonance from a textbook. They might do that, but they'll be bored and like they'll do it, but their mind won't be fully engaged. Whereas if they want to try and repeat what they saw, then they'll be thinking about that more actively. And if they show it to other people, then they'll need to essentially teach it. And teaching is the best way to learn something, but they'll at least be forced to answer questions for others or explain and like defend ideas that way. And so kind of like trick them to thinking about uh, science and STEM more than they would if they weren't curious or if they weren't inspired to do so. Thank you, it's a great advice. Uh, so um, I would like to sincerely thank you all for being here today. Um, so if any of the speakers has a final remark, um, we will close the, the event. Um, for the attendees, please, if you haven't signed the signature list, please do so. My colleagues have shared the link in the chat. And a big thanks to our speakers, Michael and the rest of the guests, uh, Julia, Takis and Astrinos. It was great. I really enjoyed <laughs> myself personally uh, with the experiences and the experiments. Um, for the rest, we hope to see you on our next scientist webinar, uh, The Evolution of Education, the STEMI School of the Future, which will be on the 25th of January. Uh, Maria and Julia will be sharing the link in the chat with more information. Um, from the scientist team, we wish you happy holidays and see you next year. Bye to everyone.